tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about cryptic encounters and villainous visitations. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Corbin Groshek and Ian Eve are voice talents Mick Dark and a full cast including Eric Peabody, Melissa Medina, Luke Fisher, Felipe Ojeda, and many more. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds Embrace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Our first tale tonight is something very special for us here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as it was written by our series creator, Craig Groshek's then nine-year-old son, Corbin Groshek, and is based on a creature of his own design as part of his own series, Corbin's Creatures. Corbin has been a huge fan of the macabre since he heard his first ghost story, and over the years has created dozens of original beasties. And this past year, he and his father have worked to bring his ideas to life. Tonight, Corbin's nightmares become just a bit more real as his feature-length tale is voiced by a stellar full cast with Eric Peabody as narrator, and starring Melissa Medina and Luke Fisher as a pair of adventurous, curious teens out to discover the truth about a mysterious abandoned barn and the disappearance of several local children. The tale also features the vocal talents of Heather Ordover, Jesse Cornett, and Elijah Ramsey. And of course, our very own sound designer and composer, Felipe Ojeda, as the voice of the creature itself. Want to bet a nine-year-old can't scare you? We'll take that bet. Without further ado, from the mind of Corbin Groshek, I present to you, The Skin Collector. The Skin Collector by Corbin Groshek. Jessie wondered if she and her brother would have more in common if they had been identical twins. The differences didn't surface unless you spent several days watching them. Minus the lack of identical faces, they seemed to have the same bond that every other pair of twins had. They could finish each other's sentences. They could communicate with a flash of a glance or eye movement. Yet, as close as they were as siblings, they were still far apart as individuals. Alec was a gun nut, as much as he could be without having his own. He read the magazines, knew all the makes and specs by heart, down to the magazine capacities and body mods and all else. 
That uncle that could talk about cars for three hours and you never understood a word? That's how Alec was with guns. Yet he was cool-headed and aimed with a steady hand when his dad took him to the firing range. So, where Alec enjoyed blowing things up, Jessie liked blowing things out of proportion. Her parents swore that she would become a journalist, as much as she loved sticking her nose in other people's business. Hey, she might as well get paid for it. One thing they would be sharing, like it or not, was the new car that their dad bought for their 16th birthday. The twins had already shared everything else, their living space, their food, their beds, their secrets. Sharing a car wouldn't be an issue. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, kids! Oh. Jessie came unglued oh, when she was led outside with her brother, both of them blindfolded, and then the blindfolds were snapped off to reveal the dull, slightly rusted Plymouth with powder blue paint freckled with rust. The brightest part of the car was the sloppy gift ribbon that had been wrapped around it. Jessie forgot all about supper and couldn't contain her excitement begging her parents to let her and Alec take it out for a drive right then. They agreed on two conditions. One, the more level-headed of the siblings would drive, and they all knew that meant Alec. Two, they would check in every 15 minutes. That last condition was more their mother's than anyone else's. There had been a rash of disappearances in the area. It was a prickly frustration to officials because the targets had no rhyme or reason, no consistent age or location, rich, poor, north, south, east, or west. It didn't matter. They had found a warm body to pin the crimes on, an unshorn and bug-eyed character that was barely fit to stand trial. He was the type that would take responsibility for the extinction of the dinosaurs if asked. But he pleaded guilty to the kidnappings, spouting wild and incoherent explanations for motives and locations of disposal and so forth, giving law enforcement and forensics a thick and chunky soup of logic to wade through. It was better than nothing. Better than believing the monster was still out there. The whole thing blew over just before spring, and by the time the twins had a new car to play with, it was the first chill of autumn. But parental instincts run deep and will make good moms and dads jump at shadows long after there's no longer a threat casting them. Alec was driving and Jessie had shotgun. She lazed back, her feet up on the dashboard. The joke was on them, really. They thought that they were getting extra freedom and their dad was a really awesome guy. Which he was, but his gift wasn't completely unselfish. Now, they could drive themselves to school. They lived out in the sticks, and making it to school on time had meant a rise and shine that their parents never got used to. Not anymore. Better yet, the news that they would be carpooling by themselves was received with nothing but joyful teenage capering. And so, the twins cruised. Jesse couldn't leave the radio alone. Alec enjoyed himself also, just silently. Before long, Mom was saying that it was time to head in, wherever they were. Alec agreed. He was tired in spite of the fun he was having. And he had to admit it. Jesse was exhausting. No amount of brotherly love would change that fact. All right, let's go home, he grunted. His sister sat bolt upright in her chair with worry lines splayed across her forehead, the universal sign that whining was about to commence. Please take the long way home, Alec, please. You know you wanna. I can't take the long way if I don't even know where we are. And he didn't. They had meandered so much that he had lost his bearings of where they sat on the rural map. Just try to... Wander around a little more on the way home, you know? Like, don't go in a straight line to get there. Eh. This is Obed County. It's impossible to go in a straight line on these back roads. Ugh, please, come on! Okay, okay, I I'll try. Alec tried to steer towards anything interesting in the landscape. He slowed down for one last place. 
It looked to be an oversized barn. Its abandoned condition made it look like a gravestone. The length of the grass and weeds announced that nobody was taking care of the place. A gravel path led off to the property and wound around the opposite side of the barn. The barn was close enough to the country road that the twins could read the faded logo of a feed company that flaked off of the barn wall. The broad structure glowered at them as they glided behind the old oaks that shadowed the road. He and his sister gazed at the ancient building as it began to catch a few of the changing colors of the setting sun. All right, um, yeah, that's it for our new car's maiden voyage. Alex said as he sped up and opened his GPS app. Jesse continued to stare out the window. We never really knew that place was there, did we? Alec asked, talking to the back of his sister's head. She was fully turned toward the window. Can you call mom and tell her we're close? He asked. No answer. Will you call mom? She continued to stare out the window. He frowned to himself. Sixteen years old and he was still the more mature of the two. She was pouting now that they had to go home. They had been driving around for the better part of an hour. There wasn't any reason to feel shortchanged. Then again, he didn't deal with the restless impulses that his sister did. Something inside of her was always eager to throw off the next restraint and rocket towards the next degree of freedom. From that standpoint, he could understand if she wasn't happy that they had to head in. He made the phone call to their mother, who was happy to hear that they were on their way. It had been a long hour for her. They pulled into the driveway of their two-story ranch house. He killed the motor and looked over at his sister. She was still looking out the window. What are you waiting for? Let's go. He said. She didn't move a muscle. He scratched his head and got out of the car and walked around to open the passenger door for her. He tapped on his phone's flashlight and shone it in her face. Whatever she was staring at with her wide brown eyes, she didn't see or hear her brother. That's when he ran to get their parents. They wrapped her in a blanket and set her on the couch in front of the TV, where she stared intently but saw nothing. Then, after about 15 minutes, she started to come around just as their mother was about to call an ambulance. Alec was the first to notice that she was looking around. Sis? Sis? He grabbed her by her shoulders and gave her a brotherly shake. Uh, I lost you for a minute there. Uh, what happened? I, I saw Emma. There was only one person that was as close to Jesse as her brother, and it was Emma. She was one of the missing persons. They never found her, never found any trace of her. One minute she was there, and the next minute she wasn't. She vanished from her bedroom, no less. Nobody felt safe after hearing that, knowing that it wasn't simply a case of wrong place, wrong time. You weren't even safe in your own home. Tears carved paths down Jessie's face, her eyes looking less wild. Her parents sat on the couch on either side of her. Alex stood with his hands in his pockets. Wait, you say you saw Emma? Her father said. Yes. Where did you see her? <sighs> on the wall of the barn. They looked at Alec and he shook his head in denial. Was she hanging like someone had hurt her? She was climbing. She was sitting on the wall like a frog or like Spider-Man. She looked right at me. I mean, right at me. She wasn't looking at the car. She was looking at me. Her family exchanged concerned looks with each other. There were trees growing by the road, sis, Alec added. It wasn't that easy to see the barn. Maybe it was the light and the shadow of the leaves. It wasn't, she said. It wasn't, it wasn't. Here, she placed her face in one hand. 
The evening closed without any sense of finality. Jessie's family insisted that her eyes were playing tricks on her, and she wouldn't have it. The twins got in the car to go to school. Alec could pass as rested. Jessie looked the same as the night before, just without the tears. Alec watched her as closely as he could. They didn't have more than two classes together besides the lunch period. He noted that she tried to talk and smile with her friends, but the gloom in her eyes that settled in the night before was still there. It didn't leave for days, then weeks. It remained like a devil perched on her shoulder, clear up until the day when their mother came into the bedroom and announced that the usual road to the school was blocked off and that they'd have to find another way into town. It was when they had left the driveway that Jesse said, Could we drive by the barn again? Yes, the barn that hosted Jesse's hallucination was now referred to as the barn. What? Why? The road it's on goes into town and doesn't put us far from the school. Alec eyed her. Is that what I saw you looking at on Google Maps last night? I just want to see it again. Alec didn't. He didn't get the creeps from the place, but he didn't like what it was doing to his sister. Like any proper twin brother, when she hurt, he hurt. But he couldn't come up with a concrete reason as to why they couldn't drive by the old place on the way to school. So they did. A silence dragged on until they took a parking space at the school. Did you see anything? Alec muttered. No, she said. The school day came and went, and Jessie asked Alec to drive by the barn on the way home. She asked him to drive by the barn the next day, to and from school. And he went. He guessed that it was part of the healing process that nobody knew was unfinished. They hawked the place every day until their usual road reopened. One drive home, like any other, Jesse asked him to drive by the barn again. He was starting to lose track of how many times she had asked him to go by the place, and the weight of it all sat on him a little heavier each time. But he was a good brother, and he obliged. The great hulk of the old place came up over the bend again, and she asked him to slow down. Stop the car, Alec. The little car crept Please. by the barn. Stop the car. She asked him to stop the car when they were in front of it. I need to... He looked at her. Are you wanting to check the place out? He asked. No, I just want to listen. He looked at all the mirrors, looked around them and hesitated. And then he killed the motor. The stillness of Obed County stole in and instantly lessened the weight of what they were doing. The breeze was a soothing whisper. Red-winged blackbirds trilled in the distance. Jessie wouldn't look at the barn. She just sat like she was tuning into her ears more than she was her eyes. And then, as if with much effort or with a stiff neck, she turned to look at the same wall where she thought she saw her friend. You're still broken up over Emma, huh? <laughs> the sound of her brother's voice made her jump. Sorry about that. She nodded. She was starting to fade away, and then I suddenly saw her literally climbing the wall. It, it was like something out of a nightmare. It was so cool to see her, and, and it was so scary all at once. She chewed on one knuckle. I just wanted to see her again, that's all. Because if, if I didn't see her, what did I see? Alec eyed the mirrors. They were still alone on the road. I still think I see Lucky. I see him pretty often, actually. That cat made more of an impression on me than I thought. The attempt at small talk didn't get his sister to bite. There was a low sound, like distant thunder, that made the twins do a double take. A sort of low rumble could be felt in the body of the car. There was a half-empty Coke bottle in the drink holder, 
and the dark liquid rippled. Alec looked this way and that, looking for the thunderheads. The sky was clear. It grew louder. It was a purring roar, like a panther, only heavier, thicker, and it peaked to a point where there was a shrill cry laid over it like a cry of pain or a distressed child. The sound made Jessie's insides twist and excited a terror in her without a nameable cause. Alec's instincts made him start the car and peel out. Both of them looked into each other's blanched faces. Alec was shaken but had his wits about him. His sister, though, looked like she had been kicked back into the dark place that she had just crawled out of. Then came the obvious questions. What do you think that was? She said. He didn't answer. She answered for him. It sounded like exotic animals or something. He nodded. He could see that her chest was rising and falling faster, then starting to pick up speed like a piston. If I saw Emma and we then just heard animals like large cats... She looked at him in mounting terror. What what if they're likely keeping large, vicious animals in that barn and feeding people to them? Oh God, Alec, what what if they're gonna feed Emma to a lion or a tiger or something? Alec's eyes ticked back and forth as if looking for an exit, but he was in a moving car so there wasn't one. Jessie's eyes were also bouncing around as she connected the dots, one terrifying connection after another, and she began babbling in a sort of panicked squeak, and she was getting louder. Alec began urging her to calm down, and he discovered that never in the history of telling someone else to calm down did they ever calm down when told to calm down. Jessie had become manic and babbled breathlessly all the rest of the way to the school. Sis, knock it off! Alec finally said. And just like that, she was quiet. Let's go! Okay, I'm sorry. Just... Let's go. There didn't seem to be any further issues until the next day, at lunch. She was quiet for the ride up, But when Alec was carrying his lunch tray into the commons, his friend Brad came up to him and said, Hey Alec, you might want to get your sister some downers. Alec's heart rate picked up when he entered the commons. The only voice he could really hear was Jesse's. It was the same torrential speech that he had heard in the car, and that could only mean one thing. She was running her mouth full auto to a group of girls leaning in at the same table and they were getting the whole thing, from the climber on the barn wall to the strange sound that spooked her and her brother. Some of the girls began laughing scornfully at Jessie and making fun of her. Others were getting angry. How could she disrespect Emma like that? It's bad enough that the girl vanished. The situation didn't need to be revived just for being part of an elaborate attention stunt. Alec just hoped that nobody pieced together that they had been on somebody else's property. One of the counselors poked her head into Jessie's third hour English. She got her attention and asked her to come into the hallway. Come see me after school? She asked. Just 15 minutes. Jessie touched base with Alec to make time for the meeting. Great. Now everyone thought Jess was going cuckoo. And you know what? Maybe she was. The ticking of the clock in the counselor's tiny office was just a little too loud for Jessie. It sounded like it was leading up to something like a bomb. The two of them just stared at each other for a long moment. I hear that you feel you spotted Emma Warner. Jess kept her eyes to the floor. Don't you want to talk about it? Me and my brother got our own car, and we drove a different way to school than normal. We we drove by an old barn that we didn't know was there before, and I saw Emma in front of the barn. Did she look hurt? No, not that I could tell. Did you go back? We drove by several times while the road out of town was closed. Did you see her again? No. Then what happened? 
I just wanted to see if we could spot her one last time. I mean, even if she wasn't real, I wanted to see whatever it was I was seeing as being her. So we drove by again, and we heard something. Something terrible, okay? And it sounded like like a lion's roar or a tiger's. I wasn't sure. And it sounded like, it sounded like someone was screaming. I started thinking that, that, that maybe Emma had been kidnapped and, and was being kept there, like maybe with others, and, and they were being fed to these big animals, and I... Just, Jess was losing her composure. The counselor's features were both sympathetic and stern. Her eyebrows were cinched, but her gaze was steady. I'm not going to judge, Miss Shepard, but you do realize how this sounds. Jessie looked down again. I think you might be experiencing some shade of PTSD from your loss of Emma, and I'll tell you that you are not alone. You're not the only student that has brought her up in the last few weeks. So you don't believe me? Well, if Emma was being held for the purpose of being food for animals, I doubt you would have seen her out in the open, let alone climbing a wall so freely. Jessie hung her head. Miss Shepard, there's no shame in being overwhelmed. You're no dummy, but we are fragile creatures. Stress and sadness will do these things to a rational person over time. My brother's waiting for me. Don't keep him waiting, then. Remember, my door is always open. Over the days that followed, Jess was quiet about her experiences at school, but at home, especially after Alec was in bed trying to sleep, she was at his bedside, staring at him until he would open his eyes and ask her what was wrong. <laughs> What's up, sis? They have Emma. I know they do. Someone has her at that barn and is going to feed her to animals if they haven't already. It was merely annoying the first few nights, but after the fifth night, Alec had enough, and he was all about some sort of plan of action. So what do you want to do? He hissed at her as she stood over his bed with wide and sleepless eyes. We need to investigate, she said. That was both the answer he expected and the last thing he thought he would hear. Really, sis? It would be the biggest local expose ever. I got the camera, we can find a way to be there long enough to find out what's going on and turn it all into the authorities. We'll be heroes and we'll save innocent people that don't deserve to be eaten, like Emma. Okay, uh, okay. For one thing, we are not storming somebody else's property with a video camera. A second, even if there really is a collection of big cats in that barn, how are we gonna rescue anyone from them? Neither of us is allowed to just lift Dad's guns. Picking a fight with Panthers calls for bullets. We can't just sit back and do nothing. She whisper whined. If I'm right, then my friend is in serious trouble along with who knows who else. The world has decided that they're all dead, and they might not be. They might be against something worse than death, and we're the only ones that have seen any signs of life out of that old place. If they're in there, and they're in danger, then the clock is ticking. Tick-tock, you know? Alex slid his jaw to the side in thought. <sighs> we'll either have to do it on the way to school or the way back. We can't let anyone know what we're up to. We'll have to come up with a cover story to explain why we're either late for school or late coming home. And that was the first time Alec had seen something like relief in his sister's eyes for days. They decided that they would investigate early in the morning when people and animals would most likely be asleep. Alec phoned the school, stating that they could be a few minutes late on account of vehicle issues. The school didn't question it. They made the bold move of leaving for school 20 minutes early. Nobody at home questioned it. The universe had officially sanctioned this investigation. It was a dismal morning, 
A spectral sheet of fog engulfed the landscape in a world of short-sightedness that was revealed a few feet at a time. It scared Jesse. Alec thought that it was perfect from a tactical standpoint. They found the barn despite the feeling of being lost, and, just like that, they turned on to the barn's gravel path for the first time. They could see the roof hovering over the world above the fog. The untended grass was even taller up close, and it drifted out of the fog like seaweed in murky water. The barn emerged, a shipwreck haunted by birds instead of fish. The path curved around the barn, taking the twins to the opposite side of the building. Here was quite an expanse of gravel, hemmed in by a tide of tall grass. Alec was the first one to feel it. The sensation that they weren't alone. A luminous flickering created an orange ghost in the fog. The twins got out of the car and approached. They found a burning barrel. There's someone here, Jess. We have to leave. We just got here. She said, and she stepped back from the barrel as soon as she had peered in. Alec came over to look. Among the rubbish in the barrel, blackened with red, pulsating embers, were several bones. Large bones. There were fragments of ribs in the mix. The sight of them made Alec uncomfortable. Oh my god! Oh my god. Alec, are those... Are those people's bones? Oh god, I can't... Why would do that? Who would do that? There was a flash and the recorded sound of a camera. No! Jessie was taking pictures with her phone. She cursed to herself when she realized she hadn't silenced the sound effect. Jess! Eric, the sound's off now. Please, Lauren. She said. They stalked toward the barn, which cast a shadow through the fog, making it seem even darker and gloomier than it actually was. Jess held her phone up with shaking hands, a blinking red light indicating that she was recording. Alec was completely dialed into his tactical senses. He couldn't see much, but he didn't see anything that indicated the presence of hostages or zoo exhibits. He was waiting for a hidden camera to give itself away with a blinking red light, but there was nothing. Sounds? There was the crackling of the barrel behind them, a gentle sound. The breeze teased his ears. A high humming sound appeared. He almost thought it was human until the breeze relented enough that he could hear that it was flies. A few clouds of flies churned hither and yon, and they filled the air with their dissonant song. And then there was another hum, but he felt it before he heard it. It was a vibration in the ground itself that became a subsonic rumble like distant thunder. It made Jessie freeze in her tracks. The twins looked at each other. The sound swelled again. There was a third sound. Speech. The staccato whispering of a single voice that repeated the same thing over and over again in a harsh whisper. It doesn't fit. It it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. The twins neared another congregation of flies, but it seemed that they flocked around something solid and tall. The sun filtered through the fog to give the figure a rusty red color as its skinless muscles flexed and twisted with its furious activity. It was stitching something to its own body. The needle was a shard of bone. 
Patches of loose skin that had clearly belonged to someone else hung around the creature's flailing torso and arms as it tried to make it part of its own body, and it just wasn't working. It doesn't fit! 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 The creature wasn't human. The ill-gotten skin was. It snapped its head in the direction of the twins and it froze along with them. The gelatinous black eyes had a gloss to them that shifted, telling Alec that it was looking them over. The twins decided to run. The thing decided to chase. No sooner had Jess's door shut than Alec had fumbled the keys into the ignition and put the car in reverse and turned in a half arc. Just as he threw the car into drive, the skinless thing threw itself against Jesse's passenger window. Blood and saliva and other things rained on the glass as the creature began barking. Its sunken black eyes were wide with the universal language of madness. Its unnaturally low voice rattled the bones of the twins, but the same throat overlaid its bellow with a shrill squeal that could rend eardrums. Alec recognized the sound right away as he felt his own jaw rattling. He peeled out of there, flinging gravel every which way. The creature's echoing bark becoming speech. Fat, 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 fat. The next day, both of the Shepherd twins looked like ghosts that had seen a ghost. They didn't have much to say to each other, or anyone else, for several days. As usual, Alec was the first to shrug off the shock and don a mask of normalcy, just in time for their mother to ask about what was bothering the two of them. He explained it away as stress over school. We could have dreamed it, couldn't we? Jessie said as she stood in her brother's bedroom, gazing out the window. He sat on his bed, glued to his phone. Mm-hmm. It was foggy outside, and our senses were heightened. We, we were expecting to see something. Mm-hmm. Come on, Alec. I've been having really bad dreams. I, I want this whole thing to just be a bad dream. I mean, aren't you being affected by this at all? Alec didn't respond. Then, Jesse added, Did you get any good footage? I got pictures of everything, but the thing. Alec held up his phone. He showed her a series of pictures taken from the driver's seat of the car. Jess was caught in poses that would be comical in any other context. The window was a blur with a face that couldn't quite be made out complete with the silhouettes of clawed hands that were also blurred from frenzied movement. You actually got it, she said in a small voice. They aren't good shots. Yeah, but you actually got it, for real. Jesse touched her face with trembling hands and then took his phone to look at it more closely. There was something about Jesse's reaction to the photos that made Alec want to delete them. Seeing the creature had shaken up both of them, but she was already shaken up before. In the morning, Alec got up before anyone else and he deleted the photos. No big loss. They could have been faked by anyone with a Halloween mask. They didn't prove the existence of any strange monster or the cause of the disappearance of any lost friends. Alec walked into the school lunch commons to hear Jesse's voice once again babbling but this time it was high with tensions, and it was joined by a gaggle of other voices. Nobody was laughing at her this time. They were all mad. One of the girls surrounding Jessie took her phone from her and dashed it to the floor, cracking the screen. Their parents were called to the school for an emergency meeting. Alec stood outside the door to the counselor's office, leaning against the wall, bouncing his shoulders off of it. 
The first to come out were his parents, both wearing expressions of concern. Next came Jesse with flushed cheeks. We'll see you when you get home. His mom said as she touched his forearm and kept going, leaving Alec alone with Jesse in the hallway. You transferred the photos from my phone, didn't you? He said. The way she looked at the floor said enough. It was the closest thing I had to evidence. Yeah, of what? What we had seen and heard and, and maybe of what happened to Emma. Malik folded his arms and turned away to roll his eyes. So, what did they say? That I imagined all of it and that I need help. Yeah, well, uh, maybe they're right. Let's go, he said. You, you can't say that. You were there too. You, you saw and heard the same things I did. He reached out to take her arm, but she shrank away. How do you know that wasn't Emma's skin that it was putting on? Jesse! Come on! Jesse wouldn't come on. She took off down the school corridor faster than Alec cared to chase. He felt the last layer of his patience eroding, a process that had been in the works for weeks. You know what they say happens when the guy that never snaps finally does. He stepped outside to cool off. It didn't take him long about 10 minutes. He began pacing the parking lot and glancing at the school doors on each pass. Jesse was still in there. He got out his phone to text her. Okay, sis, we, we really need to get out of here. Another defiant five minutes passed. I, I know you're mad, but let's go home and get this day behind us, okay? His phone dinged two minutes later. It hurts, Alec. I know it does. Let's get home. We'll, we'll feel better when we're all home. It hurts because it doesn't fit. Alec's forehead wrinkled for half a second before the adrenaline hit him. He called her phone. No answer. He called again. She answered. Jesse! Hello? C can you hear me? A low, rumbling sound like an amplified purr filled his ear. Then the call dropped. He nearly tore the door off its hinges when he stormed back into the school. One of the teachers spotted him. Young man, we'll be locking the door soon and you'll need to be off the premises. Young man? Young man! The teacher faded away as Alec marched past. He held up his phone and continually redialed Jesse's number. The teacher followed him from a distance while shouting. Young man, you come back here right now! Young man, can you hear me? Get back here! Shut up! Shut Alec up, mouthed to up. himself. Shut up, shut up. That's shut up. when he heard it. His sister's music box ringtone, muffled and distant. One last redial, and he followed the hollow sound to the ladies' room. There was the sound of a crash just before he burst into the bathroom to find the phone sitting on the grate in the center of the floor. Streaks of blood led away from it and up and across the walls and out a shattered window. Alec tumbled to his knees. The looks that the school counselor had given to Jesse were then given to Alec as he rose to validate his sister's story. Suddenly, he was just as adamant as she had been that there was a skin-thieving alien on the loose. Alec had no appetite for drama, so explaining his behavior rationally was impossible. It hit the news that the kidnapper was still at large and that whoever was rotting in prison must have been the wrong man. Was this how Jessie felt when she was trying to tell Alec and her parents and her peers and everyone that she saw something out there that couldn't be explained? Alone? Isolated by 100% of the people in her world? 
Authorities were looking for Jesse for several weeks. Then they transitioned to just looking for a body. A body that wouldn't turn up like all the others hadn't. The funeral was abysmal without any remains to lay to rest. Life went on with a limp. Alec lay awake in bed. Nothing unusual for him. He had spent every single day since his sister's disappearance thinking about her. His other half. His wild, untamed counterpart. He knew she was dead. He just knew. If she were still out there somewhere, he would be able to feel it. The distance he felt inside of himself was a sanity-crushing ache. A breeze stirred him from the uneasy sleep that had overtaken him. The curtains around his open window billowed and swayed. He liked sleeping with the window open and would do so until it was simply too cold for it. He was about to slip back under the tide of sleep when a voice drifted inside. Alec. Sleep fled him, replaced by a strange sort of anxiety. The name was on his lips before it was in his thoughts. Jesse? He was at the window in an instant. Nobody answered him, and no one confronted him. He threw on some clothes and went outside. It was a full moon, and it was directly overhead with no shadows to cast. There was still nobody. That is, until he turned to go back inside. A familiar shape blocked the door. It stepped forward, and the face of his sister was revealed. But it wasn't her eyes in those dark sockets that were boiling with black madness. Alec. She said it with a smooth voice that trailed into a deep purr. She slowly came toward him, allowing him to see that her shape was all wrong. Like the body underneath wasn't made for the skin. It hurts because that does it fits. I hope you enjoyed The Skin Collector, as written by Corbin Groshek and narrated by Eric Peabody. Also featuring Melissa Medina, Luke Fisher, Felipe Ojeda, Jesse Cornett, Heather Ordover, and Elijah Ramsey. If you enjoyed that last tale, keep your eyes peeled for more from Corbin as he unveils his latest creatures in the coming months. Future announcements will be made on our official YouTube channel and our social media. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by the Iron Eve and both performed and produced by the latest addition to our macabre menagerie, a gentleman with a penchant for the paranormal and a voice perfect for telling terrifying tales, Mick Dark. Mick series of the same name debuted on our channel this past September, and we've been featuring two new tales from him every week. Tonight, you'll get just a taste of what this talented storyteller has in store for you. So settle in. Get comfy and brace yourself. Our next tale is not for the faint of heart. Without further ado, I present to you a warning from a nightmare. Darkness coats nearly the entire room. A comfort blanket of emptiness in which only a small nightlight in the shape of a tacky, golden elephant pierces through the inky blackness. I stretch my long limbs languorously, clawed fingers scraping against the high ceiling as I study my surroundings. The room is dominated by a large king-size bed, two forms lying in the center. The first one is a well-built male, 
softly snoring and clearly deep in the throes of sleep. He doesn't interest me. The second, though, a slender female lies rigidly, eyes open wide, and darting around the room. Looking, I know, for me. She can sense me somewhere in the blackness and knows what is about to happen to her, just as she knows, after so many years, that she can do nothing to prevent it. Closing my eyes, I feel a tremendous surge of power seeping from my fingers as an invisible flow of the paralyzing agent used for centuries by my race drifts like a black thick smoke towards the occupants lying in the bed. The male, of course, is immune and completely unaware of my presence. But the female, my true target, senses the danger and makes a desperate attempt to get up and flee. But it's already too late. Surely she knows this. This is a dance that she and I have performed countless times in her short, mortal life. She is not immune, and no matter what she does to try to prevent her fate, it will always find her. I will always find her. Her eyes widen to what must surely be a painful degree, and the first sweet blast of her terror hits me square in the chest. Watching her expressive face, I can almost feel the tingle of static energy as it seeps into her toes, up her spine, and finally come to rest in the deepest region of her brain. She is mine now, utterly at my mercy, and she knows this. I continue watching as a dull resignation settles over her. Jessica, I purr, I have missed you. It's been so, so long. As soon as the words leave my jagged lips, Jessica's eyes finally focus in on my vicinity. A small breathy sound escaping from her clenched jaw. I know that she can't quite see me yet, standing hunched in the corner of her bedroom. I take a small step closer to the dim glow of the ugly nightlight. I have missed you terribly. But for some strange reason, I get the impression that the feeling is just not mutual. You managed to shut me out so much longer this time. The pills, the therapy, all those breathing and relaxation exercises, all to treat your condition. Sleep paralysis, I believe it is now referred to, in your highly enlightened age. I take another step, savoring the moment. Yes, I know all about your treatments. The medication and sleep studies, all those misguided attempts to keep us apart. I confess, I am a bit wounded. We've been together nearly your entire life, and it's time you finally accepted that we'll always be together. Or at least until I've wrung the very last breath from your ungrateful body. Can't you understand? I need you too much. You keep me nourished. Your horror and fear sustain me as nothing else can. Why would you begrudge your oldest Dearest friend, what they need to survive. It's cruel. It's selfish. Hearing the menace bleed into my tone, I pause in mid-step as a loud, sudden snort emanates from the male lying next to her. Ah, and this must be David. 
Your fiancé now, I understand. He's a big strapping young man. And a sleep therapist as well. Correct? Your sleep therapist. Sounds like he may be taking his responsibilities a bit too far, though. Surely he knows that he's not actually supposed to sleep with his patients. But I suppose I can understand the attraction to you. Surely such a large, capable man like him can keep you safe from the darkness, from me. Why don't you ask him for help? Go ahead. I will wait right here. Her eyes with their deep blue irises and grossly contracted pupils slide slowly over to the man sleeping beside her. She stares pleadingly at him, as best she can without turning her head. A tiny pathetic croak is all she can push through her stiff throat. After a moment of these tense silence, her wide eyes shift back to mine once more. No? I ask as I take another slow step, drawing ever closer to the bed. See, I knew you still cared. I'm always watching you, Jessica. I'm in your head, your very psyche, and I've consumed enough of your being to know your every weakness, every dark thought you've ever whispered to the night. When you thought you were alone, I was there, always listening. Remember all the good times we've shared together, the countless nights you've given so graciously of your pain, your life force. My mind flashes back to the first time I saw her, when she was just a young, naive child of six, maybe seven, too young to understand the complexity of what I am, but old enough to see the wrongness, the terror of it all. Her innocence and purity were the sweetest aphrodisiac I had ever experienced in my prolonged existence. I had come to her for the very first time then, aware that at the mercy of a paralytic agent, she would be powerless against me. But, unprepared for the ferocity of the pleasure and strength that her fear would give me, I fed and fed well that first night. Drawing out her anguish for the entirety of the night, relenting only when the first stray glimmers of dawn approach. I have fed off so many souls in my time, but no other human satiated my hunger like she did. I have no concept of why, only knew that her essence strengthened me in a way that nothing else ever had. I admit that I became a bit obsessed with her, ignoring any other opportunities to feed, few as they were, saving my voracious appetite only for her. I knew that I was taking too much, but couldn't seem to stop myself. I watched her grow weaker, more lifeless each time I drank from her. Most likely, she would have died if she hadn't sought out help. But finally she did, and though the treatments had blocked me out for several months, It was inevitable that I would eventually creep back in. Nothing could keep the darkness at bay forever. Perhaps it was this obsession that caused me to feel the need to unburden myself to her, to tell her things that I had never uttered to any other human. It's not your fault, really. But that of the first humans... Your early ancestors, interlopers, we were the earliest of God's creation, his beloved children. 
We too lived, loved, and reveled in the world, free to do as we pleased, live as we pleased. Whole beings who danced in the light and indulged freely in the souls of other, weaker forms the great creator had provided for our consumption. Those creatures were not unlike the cattle and livestock that your race survives on. Yes, I once held a solid, physical form much like your own. But soon, we began to crave more, need more. We soon began feasting off of each other's fears and torment. The ultimate taboo. In order to further strengthen our own bodies, eventually the Creator grew disappointed with us in our primitive and violent urges to satisfy only ourselves, regardless of the pain we inflicted on each other. He cast us out of the light and out of this world, only to see us writhe in the black, unwhole and unworthy. And then he created you to replace us. The race of mankind became his final, desperate attempt at perfection, but he failed. I take several, swifter steps towards the girl, my rage getting the better of me. It is in that darkness that we have survived, barely able to exist off those few humans. He nearly spat the word so hated as it was by those of his kind. That small portion of them who were susceptible to our powers, those who lacked the natural blockers that would render them immune to our abilities. In the beginning, less than 2% of the entire population of your race had this anomaly that left mere thousands to feed many millions do you understand? There were far too few of you to go around and millions of us starved. Went so mad with hunger that they willingly ended their miserable existence. First, my mother. Then my mate. And eventually, even my daughter. All lost throughout the countless centuries. Your God did this to us on purpose. His Holiness just couldn't condone wiping out an entire species that he once created so lovingly. In his great benevolence, he would never bathe his white hands in blood. In creating such a tiny percentage of you with the necessary genetic predisposition, or as your useless fiancé there would call it, sleep paralysis. He gave us a chance to survive, certainly, but only at the cost of nearly my whole race. The whole time, he must have known that all he really did was prolong our eventual demise and cause us all eternal suffering. It was his final gift to us, and it became our greatest curse. I was almost to the bed now, so close that I could smell the sickly sweet scent of her terror. I inhale deeply and smile. In her growing sense of panic, her eyes and nostrils flared as quick, tiny puffs of air pushed past her lips. I paused, taking a moment to calm myself. It was suddenly imperative that I finish my story before I lost all control. Do you know, I was very close to giving up, ready to face my end. When I first laid eyes on you, you were so young, so full of hope and promise. You 
reminded me much of my own lost child, and for a time, I even felt guilty for taking so deeply of your life force. But the strength, the euphoria it gave me, quickly overcame any misplaced empathy. Were it not for you creatures, my family would still be alive and be first in God's love. Nearly giddy now with anticipation, I quickly close the small gap between us and watch her eyes fill with terror. And I smile. Feeling the bones shift and my jaw unhinge with the unnatural wideness of it. As I knew it would, the hideousness of my grin brought out a fresh wave of delicious horror that I quickly devoured. All of your science and enlightenment is so wasted and ignorant. You refuse to see the wisdom that those before understood for centuries. You are not diseased and therefore cannot be cured. Rather, you are cursed, chosen by God to provide for my kind. I had to hunch down several feet nearly kneeling in an effort to reach her ear as I whispered. Your ancestors knew what we are, though they soon forgot our true origins. They believed mistakenly that the first of our kind, Lilith, was Adam's first wife, banished to make room for Eve. Although symbolically this was true, we, in point of fact, preceded Adam. We were the first beloved creations of God. A chosen people who enjoyed the ease and luxury of his favor. But our crimes against each other eventually became too great, too numerous for him to ignore. And so he cast out our entire race to make room for you. You cannot know the bleak despair, the desperation that comes from being so utterly forsaken, from having everything you are and all that you love torn so irrevocably from your grasp. But you will soon. Ever so methodically, I stalk my long razor-sharp nails across her chest. As I speak those last few words in a sing-song voice, puncturing tiny holes into her very soul and causing small streams of it to dance slowly up to my starving lips. I inhale her essence, dragging it deeply into my rotting lungs. Suddenly, with a preternational speed far too fast for her inferior senses to track, I straddled her slender body, growing more ravenous at the first small taste of her aura. I rake my long nails more deeply down the length of her chest. Feeling the rendering of her soul as I did so. As always, I knew I would leave no physical marks. There would be no evidence of my assault, if and when she finally woke. Because I wasn't cleaving her flesh, but rather the deepest marrow of her life. I nearly cackled at the scent of her pain as it reached me. The Night Mara, they used to call us. Wretched creatures who fed off soul, breath, and blood. We are the basis of every night creature of your lore. Vampires, succubi, and demons. But sadly, throughout the centuries the true nature of our kind 
has been lost. We, who are the authors of everything your kind fears, every bump in the night and growl in the darkness, were relegated to nothing more than dreams, and the night Mara would eventually become your nightmares. Lost in the ecstasy of the feeding, I savagely dig my claws into her body as deeply as they can go, and then roughly twist my fingers. Jessica reacts in the only way she is able, whimpering softly through clenched teeth. If only you hadn't tried so hard in your attempts to keep me from you, denied me to the brink of starvation, then perhaps, perhaps, I could have satisfied myself with a small taste, just a sampling of your agony. But now, I cannot control my hunger. Tonight, I have no choice but to gorge myself on the banquet laid out so temptingly before me. Another tiny gargled sound escapes her as numerous tentacle-like straws slither their way out of my gray, concave chest and burrow deep into the holes that my claws had made. The tentacles instantly start contracting as they begin to greedily milk the life from her. I choke back an ecstatic moan as I feed directly from her consciousness. Looking her straight in the eye, I watch as a single solitary tear emerges from her tightly closed eyelids. Ever so slowly, I lean down to lick at it with my long forked tongue. Don't cry, my sweet, not now, for you have yet to hear the best part of my tale. For so long we have fought amongst ourselves over the pitiful few of you whose spirits we were able to consume. We have been reduced to nothing more than wolves, savages, and starving dogs fighting to the death for nothing more than a miserable table scrap. But after countless millennia of watching you pathetic and weak creatures, I have come to a rather unsettling but also welcome conclusion. Humans really aren't so different from the Nightmare. Much as it pains me to say it, both of the species are parasites, monstrous and selfish beasts who feed off the weak and sickly. With every generation that passes, your kind becomes more like us and less like him. And almost overnight it seemed there were suddenly great numbers of humans being born with this lack of immunity. It was far too steep a climb to be mere coincidence. For the first time since the dawn of your history, my kind feeds and it feeds well. We have begun to prosper once again. We know the cause, even if your race is too arrogant and naive to see it. Tears begin to flow more freely from her eyelids, and I watch gleefully as comprehensions begin to dawn on her face. Yes, you do understand now, don't you? Mankind has grown nearly identical to my kind. You crush the weak, delight in your ability to destroy all goodness, and in your own way, you even feed off each other in your attempts to gain power. We have taken notice, and so has he. Your God gave you everything, all the freedoms and comforts that he once offered only to us, and you have squandered it just as we did. But, as I said before, God can't condone the wanton destruction of those he has created. 
And so he has chosen to wake you up, one soul at a time, until eventually we will reach you all. Consume every last one of you. And all of this with his blessing. It would appear that even in our hideousness, he prefers us to you. You'll soon know our pain, our despair, and you will know it quite intimately. It is unlikely that she will survive this night. My thirst is so great, and my will too weak. I can't help but feel that I would be doing her a favor, a small mercy to end it for her here and now. For if not, she would soon come to suffer the complete desolation of the Forsaken, along with the rest of mankind. It seemed somehow less cruel to just put her out of her misery. But either way, it really doesn't matter. There are now so much more of the curse to go around, and I will easily find another susceptible to the paralysis. But as for tonight, she is my prey and I have only just begun the feast. My smile slowly widens. My name is David, and I am, was, engaged to a sweet, beautiful woman named Jessica. She, she died last night. The doctors all say that it was a heart attack, a painless and easy passing in her sleep. Maybe. Hopefully that's all it was. I, I woke early this morning from the darkest, most graphic nightmare of my life to find her lying cold and stiff next to me. Her frozen fingers were stretched, resting less than a centimeter from my own hand, almost as if... In the last few seconds of her life, she'd reached out to me. Jessica had suffered from sleep paralysis nearly her entire life. That's how we met, in fact. You see, I'm, I'm a sleep therapist. And she had the most debilitating case of the disease that I had ever seen. Over the many hours we spent together, I couldn't help but fall in love with her. And she was getting better. It had been several months, in fact, since she had an episode. But last night... The nightmare I had, well, I was the demon in the story. I saw and felt everything from his point of view, and just as he predicted, Jessica did die. And the preceding story had been an exact account of the dream that I had that night. Now, I've always been a man of science. I, I don't believe in the paranormal or demons, and I certainly don't believe that our nightmares can hurt us. Or at, at least, I didn't. But this... This, this creature, or whatever he was, was right about one more thing, and it haunts me most of all. In the past five years, the reported incidents and severity of sleep paralysis have nearly tripled. Medical science has no real explanation as to why. What if... What if everything that happened last night, it, if it wasn't a dream, but a warning... I hope you enjoyed A Warning from a Night Mara, as written by Ian Eve and both voiced and produced by Mick Duck. If you enjoyed Mick's rendition of that tale, check out our YouTube channel where you'll get two more doses of darkness from him each and every week. As of tonight, there are more than half a dozen stories for you to sink your teeth into, so don't delay. Check him out today. And while you're there, check out our other series as well, including Wesley Baker's Hood Horror and Drew Blood. You won't be sorry you did. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has nearly come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a five-star review, and a kind word. And follow us, please, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube 
where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012, and consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for 